All righty. Welcome. We are back. We are back. As the song says, we are back. America, happy fourth. I know a lot of people out there probably drink a little Jack Daniels, got a little uh, grilled chicken, mm-hmm. some hot dogs, yep. beer. Macaroni and cheese and macaroni mashed potatoes. Macaroni and cheese and mashed you know, potatoes. Maybe you, maybe you took the time to bake it this morning. You're that's like, you right. Know, extra prep this morning. That's you know? right. Because the fourth is on a Saturday. Man, that's crazy. Merkel. Saturday this year. Merkel. But we wouldn't be back unless we knew that sports is on the way. <laughs> and they're coming. Finally, man. You know, I'm still on the fence about this whole baseball thing. Like everything else, you know what, to be honest with you, I'm actually surprised that we're even back this soon because I could have swore that NBA, MLB, and NHL would have all just can't. Well, I would have wished for selfish purposes only that Major League Baseball would have went ahead and just canceled the whole season. Yeah. So then the Yankees can just go ahead and get all the way healthy <laughs> yeah, so right. we can just fully dominate. <laughs> yeah. But we'll get into that later. I was I on the opposite news side about, of the spectrum because I need the Sox to play this year. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes, but sir. it is the Mac and Black Podcast. We are back after a three and a half month hiatus. That was totally not our fault. I'm El Oso Negro. Still that guy. The black portion of the show. That's Mac IU. The Mac portion of the show. We are back. Hell right. And on top of that. We're just going to take like the next hour, hour and a half to kind of smooth everything back in. And then before you know, we'll be talking um, NFL training camps will be coming up here soon because the NFL. So check this out. I read something where they said if the if the NFL did not have fans in the stands, they would lose almost five point five billion dollars yeah. if they didn't have fans in the stands. There's no way in hell there is no fans being in them stands, social distancing or no social distancing. Yeah. Them them stadiums gonna be packed. Not with those owners, they're like, listen, make it seventy percent capacity if we have to, but. Run that. Ain't Run no that way. Ain't no way. If I was in that meeting and Roger Goodell, who was, who had to be drunk at the draft, you can't tell me <laughs> nothing. The way he or or something like it, it, I I want to say somebody slipped in some LSD or something. The way he was looking at the screens, he looked all he looked like a <laughs> lethargic. I don't know what's going on with he him. He was like he was like he was like he was like, hey Miami, I got some help for you here. Who are you talking to? <laughs> like, I think the thing was, it. L- let's be honest, that format is awkward, right? Like when you have, okay, the Premier League is trying it, right? right. They have a Jumbotron with a bunch of people on Zoom and yeah, and they're kind of cheering on Zoom and it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't translate. Like I get it. You want the fans to enjoy and have an experience, but nobody is chomping at the bit to be a Zoom fan. Like the whole ask, the whole thing about being at a game is you're there with everyone else and it's just sort of this energy that you get from being with 20 plus thousand people at the same time. Right. So, you know, I I understand what they were trying to do. Like, listen, let's be 100% frank. The NFL, um, they adjusted quick to that shit as far they as, the, uh, you know, they said, we're not going to miss the draft. We need this, you know, because they knew that the draft is a precursor to the season. And if they don't do the draft, it's not looking good for the season. Right. right. So, um, plus, plus think about it like this. Mm-hmm. They said this was the highest watch draft. Yeah. Of all the drafts. And for as much as I feel that that is a good stepping stone. Yeah. At the same time, there's nothing else on. Are you are you, exactly? Are you really gonna flex on that? Yeah. You you really hadn't had sports in almost what maybe about a month and a half or so since that happened. Yeah. So of course, with everybody being at home, not doing anything, and like you said, giving hope to the NFL season. Of course, everybody in their mom was going to be sitting there watching yeah. the draft. Yeah. So of course, that was going to be the highest watched draft. But I'm gonna tell you what. That draft was very interesting. Mm-hmm. And and I'll say this. Um, the one team that kind of stuck out to me, I don't know, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, no, but the great. one team to me where I'm still on the fence of what they did because I thought they could have went with one more playmaker is the Miami Dolphins. Yeah. I thought the Miami Dolphins, okay, so so supposedly you're supposed to tank for Tua, but luckily for you, the football gods blessed you to yeah, let Tua really fall did. to you yeah. at, what was it, three or four? Yeah. And then, well, four. Four. Because the Giants had three. So then you end up getting Tua, but then when Roger Goodell, as I forementioned, says, we're going to get him more help, 
I'm thinking, okay, you're going to get him a playmaker. You're yeah. going to get him a wide receiver. Yeah. You still got C.D. Lamb on the board. You still had a couple of these other wide receivers on the board. Yeah. And all they really did was beef up the line. They kind of got a couple of more defensive backs, even though they went ahead and signed a uh, uh, Byron Jones at the yeah, end of, you know, from signing. Dallas, yeah. who was, which was a great signing. So I'm still on the fence. Uh, you know, Devontae, at, or, uh, Devontae Parker is a really good wide receiver. But I'm thinking, why not give Tua a tight end? Yeah. Why not give him another wide receiver? Maybe another running back. Like, that's what I'm thinking when you say there's a playmaker. Yeah. But you get him another young offensive lineman. So, okay, so you're trying to protect him. Right. That's cool. But now where's your playmakers? Where are those guys coming from? Because especially, yeah, I, I don't want to downplay him, you know, them getting offensive line help, especially knowing that the guy's coming off a devastating hip injury. Yeah. But I'm just thinking, where's your playmakers at? Yeah, and and listen, that has um that has Belichick written all over because of Flores, right? Brian Flores is a is a Patriots guy, and clearly um they saw it as, you know, the NFL sort of has changed in the last 10 years, and we know this, that the value of a running back and the value of a wide receiver and the value of skill position players in general has tanked really, really heavily in the last 10 years. Right. Um, whereas, you know, five or six years ago, you would see tons and tons of running backs and wide receivers and tight ends and all of these skill position players. And now teams more than ever are saying we can find people to fill those slots, but I need big bodies up front. Um, and I listen, Brian Flores, I love what they did in the offseason, to be quite honest. Yeah. Great, uh, great uh, offseason for free agency to, to build that defense. You mentioned Byron Jones. They got a couple of guys up front as well um and then on top of that you know it's it's tough it's it's going to be tough for Miami next year like people people sort of had this idea that Miami's going to be good next year and it's like I think they're seeing it the way we're seeing it which is they're not there yet and they're trying to build that there and and let's remember they still had that slew of draft picks and they have still have money to spend yeah so clearly they're you know they're plotting a little bit but it had Belichick written all over it for me because clearly Brian Flores said, I'm going to build this team with Tua and then I'm going to protect Tua because let's be honest, Alabama had the best offensive line pretty Facts. much throughout the whole tenure of, of Tua, right? Right. So when you had that type of level of offensive line, you really want him to have that comfort level. But yeah, no, there, there was a couple of different teams during the, during the draft that you said, um, this is really interesting, but also is this going to work? And Miami right. was one of those for me. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I've been I've been picking fights with Green Bay Packer fans throughout this whole pandemic, nice. calling Aaron Rodgers the most overrated quarterback oh, that's man. going in, in in the NFL. And I will not stop saying that <laughs> for everyone that keeps trying to make Aaron Rodgers to become like the second coming of Jesus when the man's only been to one Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, think about it like this. And I hate to bust Green Bay Packer fans' bubbles, but look at it like this. Since the 2000 season, the Bucks. Mm. And the Packers mm -hmm. have both been in the same amount of Super Bowls. Right. And have won the same amount of Super Bowls. Yeah. Yeah. Yet Packer fans will keep telling you how their team is much better than mine. That's all I'm trying if to say. If we're judging this off championships, and we're judging this off championships, right? Because so. think about it. If you ain't first, you're last. Especially in the NFL. And in the yeah. NFL, if yeah. you're not first, you're last. Yeah. Right? Okay, that's all. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. Like it's cool. Oh my God, the Green Bay Packers went 11 and five. That's cool. Oh my God, they went 12 and four. That's cool. MVP oh, season for oh my God. yeah. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers only threw six interceptions. That cool. One Super Bowl to show for it. Yeah. Drew Brees, you put him in that same category, trying to be a stat patter. Same nonsense, dude. All I'm saying is Green Bay must saw something I saw. Because they came out of nowhere and drafted yeah. Jordan Love in the first round. Yeah. And I totally didn't see that coming. For a team so desperate for wide receivers. And yeah, once again, crazy. there was two or three of them left on the board for them. They went quarterback pretty much almost letting Aaron Rodgers know that you're about to get Brett Favre just like we did you. Yeah. We got to look towards the future. You're not getting younger. We're getting the same results. Yeah. We need to groom somebody. And it also almost makes me s seem like maybe that what's his name is being hard-headed. Uh, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers yeah. I'm almost starting to think that Aaron Rodgers is either being hard headed, a straight pain in the ass, because, I mean, hell, the New York Giants didn't go out and draft Daniel Jones until Eli Manning was literally on his last leg. Right. You would think that Aaron Rodgers would have at least, what, maybe four, five, six more good years left yeah, in him. And you would think he's such a legend that they would say, please stay as long as you need to, right? Bingo. Yeah. But they're like, nope. 
we want Jordan Love. And correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they not trade up to get yeah. Jordan Love? And the worst That's part is, crazy. it's like there's everybody who looks at this team says the same thing. Aaron Rodgers is great. They have a couple of good running backs, but they need help. He needs help. And it's such a blatant um, sign of where the team is that they said, we don't care what our franchise player thinks about this. We see this as a directional move, meaning we need some help other than Aaron. I know they came out after the draft and did some damage control and said, listen, you need two quarterbacks to win in this league and da da da. And we have our two quarterbacks now. That only flies with a couple different people. Like, let, let's be honest, Nick, because we haven't talked much about the Tom Brady to, to, um, to Tampa Bay stuff, and we will talk about that for sure. But one thing that that really proved to me is nobody is safe in the NFL. True. And the valuable players, you have to coddle them. You have to do a good job of making sure to take care of them because you want them to sort of reciprocate that same respect and love for you. And when that, when that breaks and all, everything is off and right. all things are on the table. Now you have Aaron Rodgers. You, you have to be, if you're Aaron Rodgers, you have to be thinking about a move out West now, right? You know, after this drafting, if things don't go terrifically this year, is he going to just say, listen, I'm done. You know, send me to San Francisco, take Jimmy back if you want, whatever, right? There's, there's different things he could have done. I mean, listen, um, the Chargers, they, I know that they drafted uh, Herbert, Herbert and, yeah. and, but right now it's basically Tyrod Taylor, Justin Herbert, and um, what, you know, what may be Colin Kaepernick, which, you know, um, it, just to bring that up for a second, Aaron Rodgers, obviously he's a Packers guy and I hate the Packers and I hate Aaron Rodgers, but, he earned my respect a lot when he came out. He's one of the first people to come out and really say the NFL owes Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick an apology. Um, you know, obviously we haven't been around to talk about it on the show, but you know, this country is going through a shift and it's a, it's a, you know, kind of a conscientious shift of, um, you know, what's what we value and, and morals and just sort of the basic human decency and, and the human contract, right? We all have a social contract that every single day we're going to live with each other amongst each other. Everybody's going to handle their own business. Nobody's going to hurt each other. You know, we sort of have these social contracts that we have and, um, some of that social contract has been broken and it's been broken for, a long, long time for black people in this country. And what Colin Kaepernick did was essentially give, give people a voice in a peaceful way. Right. And what the league did was sabotage that person and make sure, go out of their way to make sure that this person was basically down and out and had no other options. Right. And then what happens is, this whole shift happens. We all know about George Floyd. We all know about the protests going on. Unless you're living under a rock, you kind of understand that the shift, uh, the, the shift that's going on in this country. And what's happened now is everybody's going back to the same sort of tired argument of, well, if you, you know, you need to do this peacefully and this and this and that. And you know, specifically the NFL was so hypocritical about it. And um, I think now people are starting to understand what Colin Kaepernick was really trying to say during his protests. And, to go back to what I was saying, I do respect Aaron Rodgers in, in a way because he was one of the first people to say it was never about the flag. It was never about troops. It was never about the military. It was always about systemic oppression. It was always about police brutality. It was always about the sort of inequality that we see in society. Um, and um, and he, now the NFL is playing damage control and PR and saying, no, we support Colin Kaepernick. And oh my God, anybody who wants to give him a job, please give him a job. When for the last four years, you guys have been no doing nothing but talk shit on this man. Exactly. So, um, so, you know, I think the, the NFL... Did you hear what they want to do now? They want to play the black national anthem before the national I didn't hear anthem. About that. Cool. Let's take real steps. Let's give Colin Kaepernick his job back. Let's really, really do what we need. Don't do these cosmetic things. That's right. what really bothers me right now about our society is everybody wants to just kind of put this cosmetic um, you know, change forward. You know, I want to, you know, let's, let's all be together in a quiet. And it's like, listen, man, we need actual, we need actual action. And I want to see the NFL take that action. Also, let's be honest, the NBA has done 
thousands times more for oh. this type of movement than the NFL did. And the NBA is light years and Adam Silver is light years ahead of Roger Goodell and the NFL. Um, and you can see that the players, yeah, there is some tussling and some disagreements between them about this bubble. I think a lot of it has to do with safety. I think a lot of it has to do with maybe it being a distraction from some of the stuff that they want to talk about. Right. But the league has worked with the players to make sure that the players feel comfortable with that. And, and I think that's better. So, you know, Roger Goodell in the NFL, they have some they have some making up to do for sure. Todd says you are out of your mind if you're trying to say that Green Bay and Tampa Bay are on the same level because they both have the same amount of Super Bowls. He said that Green Bay almost every year has been a Super Bowl contender while Tampa is almost never discussed in that way. Not saying Tampa is a terrible team, but they are not the same level. OK, so let me ask you this question. What do you get out of just winning 12 games every year? Ask the Buffalo Bills how that worked out for them. Thank you, Mac. <laughs> Thank you. That's my point. Because then, because Todd's a Chiefs fan. Mm. Okay. Prior to this year, you weren't, dude. Oh, he's still coming off that new championship high. You feel what I'm high. saying? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to explain to people that a lot of people don't want to listen. Because they hear Tampa and they know that we've sucked for so many years, you know, over the last many years. We've been bad. But if we're measuring success, what does a 12 win team do that hasn't made the Super Bowl or a 16 team? Like what is, what does a 16 and O season do without the, without, without the, the championship? Ring. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. So every, so you're okay of thinking that green Bay is that much better than us because they win 12 games to get a participation trophy by getting to the playoffs, but having even sniffed the Super Bowl, they have not been in one. Since they won one. Yeah. Okay. If they had been in one since they won one, we're not even having this discussion. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers has not sniffed the Super Bowl since he's been in one. Yeah. So what exactly am I supposed to be impressed with Green Bay with? Yeah. That's my point. That's what I'm trying to say. For everyone that keeps saying that this man is the, you know, the second best quarterback to Tom Brady and the set third best to Patrick Mahomes and all this other nonsense. That's, good, but that's great that he can go out there and go 20 and 0 touchdowns to interceptions against the Bears, Lions and Vikings, but yeah. then you get into the playoffs and your sorry asses can't even beat the Arizona flipping Cardinals? Are you kidding me? Where is the love in that? And, and, and what also, when he says level, when he says how could you say that they're on the same level? Listen, dude, there's two levels in the NFL. The, the Patriots and, and the people and, and the people who win championships and everybody, and everybody else. else and everybody else. Right. So that's that's the thing about um, that. That's what makes the Patriots such a special organization is they created a level for themselves. Right. Because of how successful they've been. And to say, listen, man. It's all subjective. It's all opinion. Obviously, you're entitled to your opinion. But at the end of the day, I think what you should be really thinking about is what the goal is in the NFL. What's the goal? It's not to have a good season. Trust me, my, my team had a great season two seasons ago. I'm not sitting here loving my life or saying that we're better than anybody else right now. We're all on the same level trying to catch what the Chiefs did last year. Yep. Right? So that's, that's what the real – that's what's so special about football in general as a sport, you have 16 games in the in the regular season and you have a postseason and only one team can at the end of the season say they had a great season. Yep. In baseball, it's 162 games. Listen, nobody's going to take a 110 win uh, season away from you. If you're the Seattle Mariners, what did they win? Like 110 a, a, a long time ago. Yeah. And they didn't end up winning the World Series. People still look at that and say, wow, that was a great season. Da, da, da. And because the season's so long and so drawn out, you almost have to give them credit for it. But in the NFL, it's such a different beast, man. You have to win the NFL. You have to win the trophy in order for it to mean something. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Like Todd says, I'd rather make the playoffs every year than not make the playoffs. So basically, you want participation trophies. Yeah. That's what kills me about Bucks fans. There's all these Bucks fans that's happy that Tom Brady's in Tampa just so they can make the playoffs. Uh-uh. Yeah. I'm the guy that's saying we're taking the ship because then why bring in Tom Brady? What for us to just make the playoffs? Yeah. And it's Dude, like that's that, that, that what's what's that? That's a loser mentality. As a Yankee fan, I found it as a user mentality because every year I talk about the Yankees, I expect us to be in the World Series. Yeah. And I expect us to win it. Just because we've been so bad, the Bucks have, 
I don't want to just be, well, let's just try and get us like, that's like if you go to a buffet, you paid, you paid $25.95 for the prime rib buffet. You went and got a scoop of mashed potatoes and said, I'll come back later for the prime rib. Hell no. You go out there and you get at <laughs> least three to five. You fill that damn plate up. Plate you sit up. it down. You get your ass right back up there and get more so that you have three plates in front of you. That's why you paid the $25.95. Yeah. That's why the Buccaneers paid $80-something million to bring Tom Brady in. Not for us to just make the playoffs, yeah. but for us to win the goddamn Super Bowl. Yep. So if you're a Green Bay fan and you're sitting here talking about, oh, I'm so happy that we make the playoffs more than the Buccaneers did, here's how many Super Bowl championships we have. Here's how many championships you got. Here's how many Super Bowl appearances you got. Here's how many Super Bowl appearances we got. So who's really had the better season? And ask Tom Brady what the goal is. Like, that's the thing that really impressed me the most about the Tom Brady thing was that not only did, not only did Tampa Bay do a tremendous job of convincing the dude to come there, right? He didn't have to. He had other options. Um, and he could have stayed in New England if Even he wanted to. Even better options maybe yeah. than Yeah, us. yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, a lot of people would argue that the Chargers, their yep. offense is way more equipped right now. And also their defense has it, uh, has it right now, whereas the Buccaneers defense is still growing, right? So... Clearly, if you ask Tom Brady what the goal is for this year, he's not telling you maybe we'll take 10, we'll take 10 wins. You know, he's thinking Super Bowl. Thank he's you. thinking we need a win. And listen, um, if you're if you're on if you're on a treasure hunt and the goal is bars of gold, and that's your that's your treasure. That's what you're getting at the end of the at goal. There you go. If that's what you're getting at the end of the at the end of the treasure hunt, and only one team gets that. Is anybody really talking about the journey to almost getting that gold? Great point. You know, nobody's saying, <laughs> nobody's saying, man, I was that close last year. Last year I was, ooh, I was right at the finish line. Because that's not what the goal is. The goal is to get the bars of gold. Can I give you a better one? Yeah, please. I was trying that's, to think of one. That's, that's, all like, I think that's of. like if we're having the Civil War and someone's like, Let's go talk to the Confederacy and see how they feel on the losing end. Sure. Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. Well, the winners I write history. Care. The Thank winners you. write history. Thank you. Yeah. No one's going out to buy a book of losers. Or the Buffalo Bills. Like, again, ask. I, I know a Buffalo Bills fan personally. I can tell you that the dude is obsessed with the Bills, and he will tell you the same thing. There's nothing fun about what the Bills did in the 90s. Like, there's it's no— It's impressive. It's impressive, but are you, are you, at the end of the day, as a Bills fan, saying, wow, look at how good the Bills were? No, I think the, I think the, the main point was it doesn't matter that you're that good during the regular season. It doesn't matter that you had a miraculous postseason. If you didn't get it done, you didn't get it done. And that's the tough part about the league. Again, you're entitled to your opinion, but I think what I would say is if we are going off of a goal and the goal is to win a championship, that's all I really care about. You know, if I'm the white, let's, let's say for example, the White Sox, honestly, you know, we can't talk about it in context of this year because it's going to be a 60 game season. But let's say it was 162 game season and they, the season started when it was supposed to. The White Sox had this amazing offseason. And if I looked at us and we had 90 wins, you know, that's a small win in my book. Right. right. Like in my own heart, I'm like, oh, my God, we had 90 wins. Great. But am I going to go out and start to talk shit to people about how we had 90 wins and 90 wins? I'm better than the Cubs because the Cubs probably will have 80 something wins. You know, we as sports fans have to, you know, really distinguish what our goal is. And the goal is always to win a championship, especially in football. So right. um, and you can't do it alone. So I understand Aaron Rodgers can't do it alone. But again, let's not crown this dude without really holding him accountable for what it Thank actually you. is. Thank you. Christopher Brown wants to know, <clears throat> Mac, let me ask you something. If Tampa had the foresight to give Winston one last shot, could you see have seen Brady go to someone like the Indianapolis Colts and throwing to T.Y. Hilton for the last couple years of his Ooh. career? Well, well, here's the thing. Um, he would have went to the Colts if he wanted to, mm. Brady. It wasn't like it was like, is it the, you know, I think what it happened was, um, I think Tom, first of all, I think he got sick of New England, you know, in a way that it's exhausting to do what New England does every single year. Right. To be under Belichick every single year is an exhausting thing. It's not easy. People think that, you know, ask Gronk about this. Listen, Gronk has been out for two years. The reason why he came back is because he didn't have to go to the Patriots, right? So 
And he he already said, I only want to play for Tom Brady, right? right. So um, here's what I would say about the scenario that you put out. First of all, the Bucs were never going to bring back Jameis Winston. That wasn't going to happen. They made it very clear. Almost Especially two, after you threw that last interception against Atlanta, they weren't But it was also, back. Nick, you know this more than anyone, the way that Bruce Arians was talking about it, the way that the GM was talking about it, the way that some of the media oh, was talking about Jameis Winston was very specific about like, dude, we're not committal on this dude. And when you do that, when you go out of your way to do that, players notice that. Agents notice that. Like Jameis Winston's, agents had to have noticed that they were pushing him out after the season was over. Right. So, you know, to your scenario, I don't know if he would have chosen the Colts over the Bucks uh, if they brought back. Honestly, even if they brought back Jameis, they probably still would have went out and got uh, uh, Tom, Tom because yeah. they said, you know what? You know, at this point, we know what Jameis is. And listen, Jameis went into the same exact situation now. He's in New Orleans now, right? So he's backing up and he's, he's you know, at the end of the day, you have to look at it in terms of Tom Brady got to pick whatever he wanted. He could have went to the Chargers if he wanted to. Obviously, I'm I'm okay with what uh with uh with what Indianapolis did. Obviously, Philip Rivers is a decent option, but it's not Tom Brady at the same time. And Tom, you you didn't have enough to make Tom Brady love you. Whereas Tampa Bay did. Listen, man, that's hard to that's hard to pass up. You got two of the best receivers in the league. You've got a, a, you know, a coach that understands your your style, um, and then you're able to bring back your old buddy Gronk in addition to some other tight ends that you also have. So Bray and Howard, Bray and, and Howard, yeah. and and you know, one of them is expendable now, and you don't even need them. So yeah. that's the thing that people don't understand about uh, the NFL is like. When you're Tom Brady and you've been in it as long as you have, you're not trying to come in and work your ass off during camp and, and try like I'm glad he did what he did because what he showed was that um New England dude is a very special case. We're all trying to be New England at the end of the day. Right. And New England has a very specific thing going. And my team has almost the opposite mindset. They want everyone to have fun at all times, you know, party, you know, uh, uh, you know, party in the, in the locker room after we win and we're all dancing and chilling. And, and New England's thinking, fuck that dude. Yeah. We're trying to win. And I don't care if you have fun. And honestly, if I hurt your feelings as a result, go fuck yourself because yeah. this is what this is. And it does wear on you. So I think Brady, more so chose the fact that he gets to be out of that environment and not have to deal with Belichick. Christopher Brown says, I think Gronk only came back to football after pissing Vince McMahon off by refusing to do a stunt at WrestleMania. I mean, that could be it or $10 million that that the yeah. Buccaneers are going to pay Rob Gronkowski. Was he was never going to be a professional wrestler. He just no. wanted that check. It was Listen, he's on some shitty game show, too. Like, this is a dude who, when he retired, he realized he had career options, and he just took whatever he could. Yep. He was never going to be in the WWE. No, not, not seriously no. like that. No. He was like Mike Tyson when Mike Tyson came with D Generation you, yeah. X and like, you know, it's a cool little storyline, but he's not gonna be in the in the And WWE. if you think if you think the the road uh schedule on the NFL is bad, the WWE is way worse. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So there's no way you're coming out of retirement. Ask Ronda Rousey saying, about that. She said, fuck that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh the one thing that I will say about Tampa Bay mm -hmm. is the one thing that I do that I will say about Tom Brady coming to Tampa Bay. And I, I have kind of argued with Buck fans about this, is it brings a whole new mentality into the locker room. Mm. You know, the the only thing that I had a problem with with Tampa Bay is how they handled the situation. Because all of the there was so much talks that the, that the Bucks were actually willing to bring Jameis back. Then there was some uh, reports saying that that Tampa Bay had told Jameis Winston not to yield offers from other people as if they were going to bring him back. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Tom Brady just signs this huge contract to come, yeah. and he pretty much told Jameis, "Well, all the spots to fill, go find something." So the biggest fu that he could do to Tampa Bay was go sign with the rivals of him, with mm -hmm. the New Orleans Saints. And my and and my ode to Bucks fans at this point is: Can we now move on from the whole Jameis shtick? Yeah. You get what I'm saying? And what I mean by that he's is an easy target. <laughs> he, is, is he such an easy target? Yeah. But I'm done talking about what Jameis could have done, and I'm now more focused on what the Bucs can do. Right. And with us, with Shaq Barrett looking like he's going to sign the franchise tag, with us bringing back 
Sue JPP. and with us bringing back JPP, who's going to be healthy by the time camp starts. Mm -hmm. And Vita Vale, who's going to be healthy by the time camp starts. And you're going to have a healthy Devin White. And Levante Davis is excited. And the secondary is a year older, so they're a year wiser. And then as you mentioned, we got Godwin and Evans, and we hope that Rojo can come out. And we drafted arguably who I thought was the best offensive lineman on the board slipped all the way down to Kip us and Iowa. Tristan Wirfs, Tristan Wirfs got man. Tristan Wirfs. And now our land is solidified. Cause I got a buddy that's still swearing up and down that we should have, that we should have uh trade instead of trading for Gronk trade for Trent Williams. And then we could have used our draft pick to trade for Jamal Adams and all this other nonsense. I don't want to hear all that. Yeah. I'm worried about what we got right now and the core that we have right now, because I, as much as and Jamal Adams is an interesting name because he said he wants out of New York. Yeah. My thing with Jamal Adams is, is that I don't want to trade our future for a guy with a team who used a lot of their cap space and are not going to be able to resign this guy within two years. Yeah. So yes, Jamal Adams is great. Yes. He will booster our, our secondary, but I don't want to lose him basically for nothing for a lack it's not going to be a one year money. deal. You're going to have to extend him for big money. That's the reason why he wants to leave New York in the first place. Todd says that's great for Tampa, but I finally get to say this for the first time in my life. The NFL championship goes through Kansas city this year. <laughs> I mean, you're not lying. I can, but I, I can also make a case for this, right? When people say that I like to, I like to really remind them that it's restarts every year, guys, mm -hmm. you know, um, there, there is certain sports where that's true. Right. Um, you know, in, in basketball, right. You, when you when the Bulls were around, you had to go through Chicago, right? That right. was that was the thing, right? But the NFL is so special that every year is different, and every year you start zero and zero, and every year it's just kind of like how do those sixteen games go? And we don't know what the Chiefs are going to look like next year. I mean, I know they're probably going to be tremendous. I, I I don't doubt that. But again, that's that's a, that's why NFL is so special because it's like you don't know, like you really don't know. And uh, yeah, but but let's be honest, what what can City did was impressive, and if you want to, especially you wanna, in the draft. Uh, oh yeah, and and also they continue to make under the radar moves. Like yeah. we saw it with Tyree Kill a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, a Hardman, uh, Miko Hardman is a good example of that, and they did it again this year. So um, one thing that I will say is they they put on a clinic, and they do a tremendous job of teaching other teams how to treat their players, how you treat like Patrick Mahomes is going to get his aid. We know that, right. He's going to get probably the biggest uh, contract in NFL history. It's just a matter of time, but keeping guys like, you know, Sammy Watkins happy, keeping guys like Tyreek Hill happy. You know, that's a really hard thing to do. You guys like Travis Kelsey. Travis happy. Kelsey. I mean, listen, when you got four running backs who play, which they do, they have four running backs who play legitimately and they played this year, that's hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. So clearly they have good leadership. Clearly Andy Reid is doing something right. And I would agree. I think they're probably the best team in the AFC right now. But I would be, I would be, re listen, I'm really scared about what the Patriots did this year because they knew they were getting Cam Newton three months ago. Mm -hmm. All they were doing was waiting and they were just waiting. And everybody was like, wow, they haven't signed another quarterback and da, 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 da. And now Cam Newton's there and people are expecting to say, wow, he's not going to be able to run Tom Brady's office. Listen, Belichick's is not that stupid. They're going to run this offense around Cam Newton. They're going to obviously do what they do on defense. I'd be very, very scared if our team's in the AFC because you don't know what Belichick and that team is capable of until they get out on the field. We never know what they're going to look like, but um, I think they're going to be out to prove that they aren't a Brady thing. Yeah. And that's what Brady's trying to prove too, right? Brady's trying to prove the same thing. I'm not a Patriots guy. I'm Brady and I make these championships and it's going to be interesting to see. Did you hear Tom Brady's interview with Howard Stern? No, I didn't. Very interesting interview. Like Howard Stern really got Tom Brady to open up. Mm. And the one thing that Tom Brady, Tom Brady pretty much made it known mm. that he knew he was out of New England before the season started. Right. He yeah. knew he was gone. Yeah. He was like, I'm going to, I'm going to play this year. Like I'm supposed to, I'm going to honor my contract. And he was like, there's no way that I was coming back. And I guess it was one of those things where 
Bruce Arians and the Buccaneers kind of like as soon as week 17 was over with. Yeah. Once Jameis threw the interception, was just putting the full court press on Tom saying. Because they had the they had the money too. Right. And they had the they had the bread to do it. Yeah. And I guess Tom Brady, I feel like when you look at the split up, like who does it mean for much more for on the split up? Mm -hmm. I think it means more for Tom than Bill, because I think Bill's just going to go on about his day. He's like, I'm yeah. coach of the new England Patriots. We'll find somebody to come in. We'll probably build within the next two years and we'll be just fine. And where you got Tom Brady, where everyone thinks this man's just a system quarterback. He's not going to be squat without Bill, this and that and everything else. Yeah. Everyone's questioning his arm strength, which is legit. But then you got to remember that Jameis Winston and Tom Brady both were tied for seventh in deep ball, um, uh, deep pass percentage, Percent accuracy, efficiency, yeah. or something because, like yeah. that. They were both they both tied for seventh. And they don't go. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, Brady and Brady and and that team in New England didn't go deep very much, right? So, no. um, but also let's remember this. Brady always had to take pay cuts the last like five or six years, Facts. right? The last five or six years, he's had to take a pay cut because the organization basically convinced him that that's the only way for us to win consistently is if we have this extra five to $10 million that we can't give you that we can give to other players. And I think he got sick of that. I think that's one of those things where when you're embedded into an organization, you see how profitable it is. I mean, listen, the Patriots are one of the most profitable organizations in the world. Um, they could have afforded to give him something and maybe, you know, had some other position lacking. And I think that really wore thin on him. I think that's the main re people I think had this idea that Brady was like, let me find the best situation for me. I think what he did was he had his agent go out and say, listen, find who's going to give me the most money. And then let's figure out who we're going to go to. Because I think he realizes this, that he's in the he's in the twilight of his career, right? He's got the last two, maybe three years if he's lucky, right? So um, he's not going out there for, uh, for, for pride. Everybody knows that this guy's probably already the GOAT. And if not, he's in the conversation. Right. Um, but what he is trying to do now is prove something to himself almost, right? Is to say, I'm better than what the Patriots made me out to look. And let's be honest, there was a lot of times where when the Patriots were winning, it was about Belichick. And when the Patriots were losing, it was about Brady, right? So now he's going to have a chance to go somewhere new, fresh start. I think Bruce Arians is a perfect leader for him. Um, and, and at the end of the day, if it's about winning, you bring in winners and you have him change that culture, right? So Brady's going to come in there during training camp and he's going to change that culture to a winning culture and try and steal little tidbits from what he did with the, with New England. And I think it'll work, honestly. Uh, all, all I, Really, the big thing for me with, uh, with Tampa Bay is can this defense get to the next level quick? Yeah. Like we like they need to. Right. We know that they're sort of elevating, but with Brady and company, you almost need them to take a next step quicker than you would expect. Um, and if they can do that, they're going to be a great team. I'm with you on that. Remember, Tampa Bay is coming into this year with the number one ranked rush defense in the mm -hmm. NFL last year. Yep. Their Todd biggest Bowles concern. Amazing. Right. Yeah. Their biggest concern. That's why Sue was very important, because I feel like Sue, because there's so much attention to Sue. Yeah they left the attention away from Vea right. and Vea was continuously in the backfield because a lot of attention was to Sue. I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, the attention has to be on the past defensive side, but that's where I think that having Carlton Davis, the third and having Jamel Dean and having, you know, uh, SMB, Sean Murphy bunting and having, um, uh, uh, I can't, the, the safeties are blanking on me. Uh, having the, the young secondary one year grown with one another. Yeah. Now that they're all grown with one another, now you work on the offseason on communication. That's one thing that killed them last year was their communication was so terrible last year yeah. that guys were, it, it, it almost didn't come to almost like week 12 or 13 when they got on that little win streak yeah, that they, they finally started really, talking. The last five weeks of the season, that defense looked legit, and you can tell it had a lot to do with the fact that they finally felt comfortable with yep. that scheme. Yep, plus you had Devin White got healthy, yeah. JPP got healthy, you know, Vail got healthy because remember he missed the first couple of weeks with yeah. the bad knee. And then when he started, he was just a space eater. Everyone yeah. thought he was just going to be kind of like Haloti not to just take up two, but he can actually get into the backfield yep. he can go side to side. Uh, they have some dangerous. And also you have to remember, right? We have to remember what the league is now. You don't have to hold people to 10 points anymore. Right. right. All you really have to do is take, you know, 
execute on opportunities when the offense gives it to you, meaning get turnovers when you can and give the ball to your offense and let them do the rest. Right. I mean, even um, let's let's be honest. The Chiefs didn't look tremendous the last uh, four weeks of that season. They won the Super Bowl, but let's remember that for the last four quarters they played, they were down and they were having to play from behind. And it was, it's not always about what your defense does. It's how you finish and how your offense executes. And right. they just did it better last year. And remember, remember Kansas city struggled in that first half against Tennessee and they turned yep. it on. And, and that's one of the reasons I didn't pick them for the super bowl. Cause mm-hmm. I was like, listen, man, you guys the last three weeks have come out against lower talent and, and have almost let them, you almost have to let them take the lead so you can kind of play your game. What was it? Was it Houston that had a big lead on them? It was first? Houston and then Tennessee. Tennessee and, and then yeah. and then let's be honest, San Francisco outplayed them for the first almost three and a half quarters. Yep. So um And then the and then God touched Patrick Mahomes and it was And he's like, away. son, go do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Freaking Jesus Mahomes. <laughs> son, do your thing. Oh, I just got a notification about Francis Ngannou. Me too, yeah. Ngannou is back to take multiple punches to the stomach this time from a, I'm, I'm, the future <laughs> UFC heavyweight champion of the world, Francis the Predator Ngannou. And Stipe Miocic needs to stop being a bitch and stop trying to fight a lower in D.C. and get your ass whooped by the Predator. You are holding... In Ganu's belt, and it needs to end. Dude, I'm so sick of like I got into this big Facebook war with someone talking about Nick. You you are underestimating Stepe. No, you're underestimating the Predator. If you haven't watched him knock a uh, uh, Rose destroy gas out after he called him out, one of the most deadliest strikers in the game in Rose destroy got beat by his own game by an even deadlier striker in the UFC. He was out cold. He was out cold. <laughs> he didn't even know where he was at when he woke up yeah and poor guy i mean listen you you when you ask for something like that and he gives you something like that you kind of had just tilt your hat and go sorry Francis. like man i'm my bad i ain't gonna call you out like that man i was just trying to get some you know i see what rosen strike was trying to do there he was trying to you know it's also like prison rules right you go in and you find the biggest dude and try and kick him in the nuts and see what happens but uh you know it's funny we mentioned the ufc because the UFC is sort of in hot water. Let's remember the UFC was the first sport of all the global sports to basically say, we're going to keep going. Right. Right. And a lot of people gave them, you know, it was mixed reviews at first, right? Some people were saying you're putting people at risk. This is bad. And, and also a lot of people were giving them undue credit, which was like, Oh my God, Dana White, you're the best thing that ever happened in sports. And you're, you're keeping, you know, entertainment alive. And, and let's be one. I said this to you before the show, let's be 100% honest about why the UFC went on. They needed to go on because they needed money. Right. Um, you know, we, we saw that they were bought out by WME for, I think it was $4 billion Mm -hmm. in 2015. They're still paying that back bro like they're not you know they're the 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 big sort of issue right now is fighters don't feel like they're being paid enough and i would agree dude i mean listen people have to realize that the way that uh uh pay works in the ufc is you get half to show up and half to win most people are getting a twenty three thousand dollars for showing up and twenty three thousand dollars for winning and that's not including if you get fired the night you get an extra 50 maybe but At the end of the day, when you're training for, let's say, three and a half months for a fight and um, you have to pay your corner people, you have to pay your gym, you have to pay the daily expenses of of training. It's expensive to train. Right. So some people say that's that's 50,000 for three months right there. Just the training, living, you know, paying out your coaches and your corner people. That's 50K right there. Right. So what they're essentially saying is like it's almost more expensive to fight than it is to win. Because if you're winning, you maybe get, if you're lucky, 50,000. Most fighters now have have adjusted their contracts, but let's be quite, let's be clear. 70% of the UFC doesn't have job stability. They're fighting fight to fight. And if you lose, you could lose your job. So Dana White came out and said, well, this isn't a career. This is an opportunity. And a lot of people were mad about that because John Jones is pissed about his pay. Jorge Masvidal's pissed about his pay. Kamara Usman came out and said something about his pay. Um, and even Triple C, um, uh, Henry Cejudo, a lot of people are saying he retired because he was making more money outside of the octagon than he is in. And I would agree with that. This is the same guy when he won the second strap. Mm-hmm. 
when he said, I want that Uriah Faber money, yeah. you know, he mentioned like five guys that haven't fought in like 15 years. Exactly. So he needed but, I, but, the, but the message was clear. Yeah. He's like, dude, if I'm holding two straps, I need pay this me. bread. Yeah, pay me. And I don't understand, like, I don't understand what Dana White is doing, but dude, you're you're gonna lose some of your big stars to some of these other guys, like you know. Amanda Nunes came out and said, "Listen, I'm a I'm a champ, champ. I'm one of the. Gr- I mean, let's be let's be 100 percent honest about what Amanda Nunes is, male or female, one of the greatest mixed martial artists in history. Period. And the way that she's there, let's let's be honest with what she's done. She's cleaned out that division. There's no one left for her. Right. Even Valentina, um." I love Valentina, but they already fought. And Amanda already showed you what she can do with Valentina. Um, I would like to see that fight again because I think it's entertaining. Me too. But the way that she handled, I mean, listen, that, that fight with, um, the chick that, that beat a dude in MMA. What was her name? The last one. I forgot what her, she's got a weird name, but, um, what was her name? The one that she just fought. Um, sorry, I'll think of it. I'll think of it. I'll scream it out, but it was a good fight. And it was competitive, but Amanda was still head and shoulders above her. Jermaine Durand me. I'm sorry. There you go. Jermaine Durand me. Um, you know, that was a nice fight. It was a decent fight. But you looked at it and you said, that wasn't really much of a challenge for Amanda. She was kind of going through the motions. And she came out to Brazilian media and said, I might just retire. And then there was a podcast where Dana White was on and the host mentions it. And Dana White goes, what? She said that? Like, what? You're surprised that she wants to get paid? You're surprised people want to be paid? Like, Dana White to me... You know, when you're at work and your boss says a corny joke, you kind of have to go, (laughs) yeah, that was a good one, man. You know, you kind of have to sort of get, you're paying me, bro. Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, you're a clown, right? Right. Right. So that's what I'm sensing from some of these UFC fighters is they're walking on eggshells because like, dude, I'm biting the hand that feeds me, right? I want to say something about this dude, but he's the only reason why I'm getting a paycheck right now, right? So, and let's be honest, the product, um... It's a little bit lower now with no fans. It's a little bit lower in this new system. I like the fights. I think the fights are great, but I'm not looking at this in my lens. I'm a very, I'm a, I'm a keen fight uh, uh, fan. There's going to be, I mean, the UFC was bragging about 100,000 new eyes on the UFC last event. They said there was 100,000 new subscript, either new subscriptions or new viewers to that uh, to that pay-per-view event or not pay-per-view. It was, it was a free event. Um, and they're touting that as that's great, but you can't think of it like that because what's it going to look like in the end of this month when real sports are back, UFC is going to struggle and they're going to, I bet you, I bet you UFC is going to be the first ones to come back with fans because they need it more than ever right now. They're in deep, deep financial situation. And let's be honest, let's say Jorge Masvidal tomorrow says I'm done with the UFC. He's not going to struggle. He'll go to fucking Bellator. He'll go somewhere and he'll make good money, I'm sure. Um, And the UFC can't really say the same because they think that people are attached to the UFC name. And I think they had that overestimated. I think some people like me are saying, listen, if Jorge Masvidal goes to PFL, I'll go watch PFL. I'm with you on that. I'm okay with that, you know? I'm with you 100% on that. But, uh... Can uh, we stop fighting with this Stipe versus DC? Nobody wants to watch that. And it's going to happen. And the worst part about it is DC is going to retire either way. So even if he wins, the belt, the belt goes vacant and it's going to be Francis and, and Stipe again. And if Stipe wins, then Stipe retains and it's going to be St- Francis and Stipe. It's just stupid. So, so why do we, yeah, why don't we just cut out the middleman? Tell DC to stay in the booth and carry Joe Rogan because Joe Rogan sucks. <laughs> He's been really bad Dude, lately. <laughs> you cannot. I'm, I'm so. Everyone keeps defending Joe Rogan. I have not been a fan of Joe Rogan since I really started watching the UFC many years ago. I have been claiming for Frank Shamrock because I thought when it was Frank Shamrock, Mauro Ronaldo, and uh, um, yeah. uh, uh, Randy? Not Randy Couture. No, not Couture. Oh my God. It's going to kill me. Um. Uh, you talking I, about I, Brian Stan? Not no. Brian Stan. What, it, they, they were all on Strike Force. Oh, the Strike Force ones. Oh, uh, Boss Rutten. No, not Boss. God, I, well, I can't think of this man's name. He has like his own camp, too. It'll come to my head. I'm but it, Google yeah, it yeah, quick. yeah. Google it real quick. Mm-hmm. When it was those three guys, I'm like, man, Shane, Frank Shamrock's a monster. Listen to him, telling it like it is, giving us, giving us great, uh, uh, um, um, uh, giving us great stuff, giving us great insight. Here comes Joe Rogan 
Yak, 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 yak. Oh, yak, 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 yak. Oh, hey, yak, 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 And people like this man. Like Joe Rogan's, his podcast is cool. He is just falling off the face of the earth when it comes to uh, doing UFC. And, and you're not, and we're not the only ones saying this, by the way. Like a lot of people are noticing that more than ever, he's been um, a little bit off in his commentary. Like there's been some fights where he's it's almost like he's not watching the same fight as you. Like he's talking about how somebody's dominating. Yes. And then you're like, bro, <laughs> this is a really close fight. Like you're talking about this guy getting dominated and this is a close fight. And um, the problem with it is, and he said, he, listen, he's acknowledged it on his podcast. He's inundated with fighting. He's, he's, I, I would venture to believe him when he says he thinks he's the, he's watched the most mixed martial arts fights of anybody in history of, of the world. I would probably venture to say he might be right about that. And sometimes you become uh, inundated with that, but he's admitted it on the, his podcast that, you know, it's been tough for him to really see his commentary and then watch the fight afterwards because it, it is, it is at the end of the day, you know, what, what they do is, is a tough job and only a few people do it really well. Like I think DC does it really well. The problem with DC right now is that he's holding the UFC hostage because of his legacy. And he's basically telling them because I am a legend in the sport, I deserve one last shot at this, no matter who it holds up. Like, let's be honest. When, um, when when Francis knocked out Rosenstroik like that, mm -hmm. even John Jones came out and said, fuck, I'll fight this dude because because they understand that this guy's a threat. And let's say his that fight against Stipe and that fight against Derek Lewis, people keep mentioning both those fights as proof that he's not ready. And it's like, listen, all I saw during those fights was a guy who was supremely talented, who didn't have it all together in his head. And after that Rosenstroke fight, I was a little bit skeptical about uh, uh, Francis in that Rosenstroke fight because I had Rosenstroke because, listen, dude, anytime a dude has the balls to come out and say three fights in a row, I want Francis. Like, dude, that guy has got something in his head, right? right? Obviously, it didn't work out well for him, right? Because that was a brutal knockout. But I think what it showed was that Francis, if he gets two knuckles on your face, it's done. It's done and it's over and you're going to sleep. And um, and and that's that's the thing. But back to the commentating, DC is holding this division a little bit more hostage than we would like. The heavyweight division is already kind of struggling. They're getting a lot of new, <clears throat> they're getting a lot of new blood in into the division. But what's gonna happen? Because Stipe's was thinking about retirement. Stipe was, uh, apparently he has an eye issue. He's a firefighter. Like this dude is, he's got other things going on too. Um, but he knew that this was going to be a big money fight. And so does DC. But again, one of them wins. DC retires. He stays in the booth. And then we're back to Francis and Stipe all over again. Christopher so, Brown says DC's going to the WWE. They want him for the announce table when they bump Michael Cole up to upper management. And I, I wouldn't listen. If you're DC, why even do that? Like, dude, you got a supreme shot at being the voice of the UFC. Why go to a gimmicky thing? He doesn't need to. You know who may need to do something like that? You know, somebody who somebody who retired. Like, let's say this. Henry Cejudo, you've retired. You're not going to do anything in the booth in the UFC. Why not go to these these WWE cats or or I know that I know that uh, uh what's the new AEW? They've yeah. been trying to get celebrities in there, sort of give you this feel of of Nitro and WWE days. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, does DC really need to do that? Like, right. See, he's amazing in the booth. I love him in the booth. I would. Uh, one thing I don't like <laughs> is that Joe Rogan. Um, He's almost better as a two man crew. It's better when it's him and John Anik. But when it's him, John Anik, and Dominic or DC, um, what happens is I think Joe starts to try to become more conversational. And he's not like really paying attention to the fight. Because again, I forgot what fight it was in specific, but he was thinking, man, that's a 10 8 round. And oh my God, this is a domination. And like the card showed that it was a really close fight. So he's off right now. I don't know what it is in specific. Um, you know, I think also he, he was saying that he's trying to figure an exit strategy out from the UFC himself, Joe Rogan. You know, he's not exactly going to be somebody who's going to be there forever. Um, I don't think he likes to travel portion. 
now with no there now his livelihood though is a little bit in jeopardy because there's no stand up comedy. So him not being able Militich, to Militich, Pat Militich. Pat Militich. Okay, okay. That Ooh, makes sense. We found it. Thank you. I, I was Googling it. I couldn't find it. I was like, oh my God, I hope he finds this. Um <laughs> yes. yeah, Pat Militich. But no, you're you're right though. Um Joe Rogan, he's been a little bit off in the booth lately. Most deaf. So um before we continue. I want to uh, make a few announcements here. First off, it's glad to be back here in the booth. Yeah, it's great. Steve's in the back. What's up, Steve? So now, 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 I I didn't say anything when I came in, but I remember three months ago when we before we had to cancel because sports was canceled. Steve had a full head of hair. <laughs> Steve is not rocking a full head of hair. I'm kind of jealous. Welcome man. to the bald man crew, <laughs> Steve. Cause I've been rocking this bald dude. I be getting, I be getting mad when my hair starts to grow out. Cause I got this LeBron James hairline. Cause you know I'm getting up there in age now. So we got to get you LeBron James money so you can get that LeBron nah, James bro, surgery. Man, like, dude, I he's swear to God, good lately, man, I swear. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna tell you know, I mean, obviously I'm not on camera, but. Man, just a couple days ago, it's it was so hot. Yeah. And I was just like, you know what? It's yeah. all going. No, so for I sure. shaved it all off and I was, you know, hey. It'll I'm almost back, jealous right? of you that you can do that. Cause like me, it's been so <laughs> long since I've shaven my head that now I'm just so worried I'm gonna look in the mirror and be like, why did I do this? Hey man, <laughs> look, if if the Indiana Pacers, when they used to go against the Chicago Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals, if Rick Smith my boy Rick Smith can shave his head like a skinhead. Looking like a skinhead. <laughs> Freaking Rick No, but Smith. honestly, you you uh it looks good on you, Steve. So I was like, man, you might as well. <laughs> Well, I creep myself out in the mirror. Times, so <laughs> That'll happen. That'll a happen. Time For, exactly. It. First couple times you look, you're like, who's this dude? That's right. And then also... Cause see, look, I know 2020 has been a a, a very up and down year for a has lot it? of people. I, I've had a lot of fun. I don't. Know. I've been. <laughs> I'm not going to front. Outside of all of this, um, Crazy. no sports stuff. Yeah, that's been really bad, man. I've had more ups than downs in 2020. Love As a it. matter of fact, I would like to go ahead and announce, because I think she's watching the show. She said she was watching it. She had that. George Ed knows nothing about sports, That's which okay. is beautiful. I don't Because either. I can. Yeah. Me either. <laughs> I don't even know why we're in here right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you right now, because she has no allegiance to sports. Yeah. I can easily make her a Buccaneers fan Ooh. and can nobody stop. And you guys are going to be good this year. So why not? You know, why not? All right, but also that. Negro's officially off the market. Congrats yes, sir. Uh, guys. Yes, sir. Uh, to the, one of the most beautiful women in the world, except Georgette is watching. And I, and I will also say, because we've never met and we will meet one day and I'm excited to meet you, but uh, you got to catch in this guy. Cause uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of, um, we talked about it before the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. That, the idea of a relationship and the idea of like being with somebody is sometimes you get into that and it's so easy at first. Like it's so right. effortless, right? right? You're like, Oh my God, like everything's so effortless. We like talking, it flows. We don't need to really do much. And I think the idea is you're done after that. Right. Yep. And sometimes it's about putting in the work and you got a guy here who's going to put in the work and also, All the work. And, and also, you know, that's tough nowadays, right? Because you have to be able to balance your life and, and you know, your, your, your life and your life, right? You, you want to be able to give your life to somebody and it's tough to do uh, without putting in the effort. So you got a guy who's going to put in the effort. So congrats on that. Hell right. And I'm going to try and get to wear this Yankees hat too. I'm telling you, dude, this stuff is easy. It's not like, converter. It's, yeah, it's not like I'm out here dating someone that's a Red Sox fan. Oh, thank God. And then I'm just thinking like, how in the hell am they I going to have that annoying ass accent. She's like, oh my God. Um, park the car. I'll see you later. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so my sick of the so hot. <laughs> my boyfriend's hot as hell. Hey, I'll tell you what though. I tell you what though, some of my some of my New York peeps got that heavy accent. I find it hilarious. I I actually love it too. And, yeah, and I find it more hilarious. I, I have than a anything. conference call with this dude who's from his 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 number says uh, Connecticut, uh -huh. but I'm almost sure he's from New York. And the dude sounds like almost like Mike Frances, <laughs> like like kind of like you know, just so effortless and still the, on the radio, dude. falling asleep and everything like that. Dude, my Frances is such, and that so and that's what you know. Bad. That's what just shows you that New York is such a special place that 
They don't even care that Mike Francesa sucks. It's just the nostalgia of Mike Francesca. Mike Francesa is so New York that they're like, you know what? You suck, but keep doing your thing because you're in New York. You know, it's fine. Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, yeah. And the best part is him like kind of like slumped over the mic like this. And yeah. then they're like, hey, he's with, the, with, the, with the headphones like curled to these like. Uh, yeah, he's hitting the button. Uh, 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 I, I, I can be anyway. You know, I've been going to Yankee games since, uh, you know, 69. Uh, nobody cares. How and all the, all the callers are calling and, and trolling him, like, uh, you know, like just like fake calls, and he's taking them seriously. Like, what are you talking about? And it's like, at the end of the day, dude, this is just, uh, you know, this is just, you, you're just listening to Mike Francesa talk because it feels good in your head, but he's not really saying much anymore. Most definitely. Well, the last couple of things we got to talk about, man, and, 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 so let me once again remind everybody that coming up here soon, we will get m- more in depth with the NFL training camps because that segment will be coming up here soon. Because before you know it, I mean, we're already in July. Yeah. Before you know it, like, they, what do they say? They're cutting out two preseason games. Yeah. So uh, we'll give you, we'll give you guys the timeline in, in a second here. But essentially, what's going to happen is next month, Every single major sport is going to be roll, rocking and rolling. Yep. And more than likely, there's probably only going to be like a three or four week stretch for the next year that we don't have sports, which is pretty crazy because obviously, listen, the NBA, what they're doing with this bubble. OK, um, we even we even talked about that idea even before we, you know, even even before we jumped on air, we had talked about it via text message that they're going to have to find a, a safe a safe spot to do this and until they do it's going to be tough and they found that place in Orlando at Di- the Disney Resorts now what's happening is the players are sort of pushing back on this idea that it is a bubble and that it is going to be this simple because essentially what they're saying is you're stuck there for this remainder of this bubble. No matter what happens, you have to stay in that bubble, right? You know, you're not allowed to, you know, your girlfriend can't fly in. You can't girlfriend can't, you can't fly out to your girlfriend. You know, there's no such thing as like going out to restaurants anymore. So a lot of players are a, and Kyrie Irving caught a lot of heat for this one. Um, and I'll be honest with you. I understand where he's coming from um, in a way. Right. Uh, but I also see where the opposition is coming from, too. If you guys missed it, Kyrie Irving essentially said, you know, he felt like the NBA bubble and the NBA resuming was going to be a distraction to some of the social issues that most of the players are fighting for. Right. So the players are very vocal about this. And and I think he missed, I think he miscalculated a little bit about what he was talking about because um, there's ways for you guys to push the agenda and push the change that you want within this NBA season. And I, don't, I think what he was thinking was, are we going to be a distraction from some of the social issues that we care about? And I think the general consensus is no, you're actually going to help. And I, you know, listen, am I, uh, they're going to put stuff like black lives matter, say, say their names, you know, there's, they're going to, they're going to have these kind of, you know, token slogans that you're going to be able to put on your Jersey. That's cool. I'm fine with that. All good. Um, but let's make real change, right? Like, I, I think that's, that's something that's really hard to make people realize is that, you know, black people and people who are fighting for black people in this country aren't looking for theoretical wins. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who care about the black national anthem being played before, um, before the national, the U S national anthem during football games. That's going to be cool. It's a cool symbolic thing. But I think at the end of the day, everybody who, also feels that way. They also would like to see actual substance and change and and policy and and start to see some, I guess, measurable change. You know, you want to be able to see some of the system be changed before you start to say, well, it's a win that we can now put stuff on our jerseys. So I understand both aspects of it. It's a really sensitive subject, right? Because at the end of the day, Everybody wants to push for this agenda of change, but at the same time, it's your livelihood. Right. And at the same time, you know, 
a lot of these people feel responsibility. Like Re LeBron James said something about the fact that I feel a responsibility to continue this for the country and for this, um, to, to maybe to give us not only a distraction, but a, sort of a refuge from some of the craziness we've been going through, man. I mean, you know, let's be honest, 2020 has been the craziest year of most of our lives. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there, that's crazy to say because people that are living right now have been through some of the craziest shit that's have, happened in human history. But I don't think anybody... Um, I don't think anybody can say confidently that, you know, this is going to work out 100%. Like people in the in people saying, well, what if somebody gets sick in the bubble and then they get everybody else sick in the bubble? You know, these are the risks that we have to take. You know, I'm, I don't, I don't know about you, but I told this to my parents too. We can't live on eggshells. You know, at some point we did our, we did our job here, right? Um, you know, me and you were sort of skeptical about Corona before we, stop the show right simply because we both understood the effect it might have on our livelihood mm -hmm. and how it's going to change our lives and um i think once we understood that the math was about you know creating a little bit more time for healthcare and uh, giving people a little bit more time to f flatten the curve and give us a shot at this and i think we did that for the most part right, right. and i think what we have to do now is you know, we have to live life safely, you know, wear a mask when you're out in public, please make sure to do the right thing. This isn't, listen, the mask isn't going to cure anything. The mask is a preventative measure. It's so that you're not spreading anything. So listen, am I going to tell you to stop going to the grocery store? No, go to the grocery store. If you want to go out to the park, go out to the park. But listen, if you're at risk, stay at home. And if you're not at risk, you have to leave and you have to be able to, you know, sustain your life now. Because let's be honest, millions of people, how many people are unemployed in this country now? 50 million people yeah, in this country are unemployed. Crazy. Um, crazy. So, you know, the responsibility is that, we are going to be safe. And now everybody resumes their livelihood. And, and that includes the NBA. So I'm, I'm happy they're coming back to be quite honest. I still say, I still say the baseball season should just wait. I, I was, listen, because we were, we were confident that baseball would be fine. Right. Because we're like, it's so, you know, it, 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 it only affected NBA. And then we thought, okay, well, baseball already had their spring training. So, I mean, they might as well start the season. And then what happened was, um, Let's be honest. The Rudy Gobert situation is really the domino that sort of knocked over I'm with everything, you 100%. right? Because he was you 100%. such a douchebag. He was such an asshole that he wanted to make sort of this, you know, everybody wants to be a rebel in these times, right? Oh, fuck the rules. I don't need to. And he was, what, touching every single mic and coughing on it and, you know, making a joke out of this. And this dude had, had coronavirus. And... And let's be honest, uh, he gave it to Donovan Mitchell and Donovan Mitchell was not happy with him, right? He, I, I don't think the Utah Jazz were happy with him in general. So what, what, end, what that ended up happening is they realized, wow, all it takes is one person to ruin this for everyone. And let's be honest, it did ruin it for everyone because weeks after that, the dominoes started falling. Everybody was canceling. Everybody was delaying. And let's be honest, we don't know what's going to happen with the NFL season. The hope is that the NFL is going to be fine, but we saw how quickly things can change, especially with this current situation. Right. I'm with you on that. And, and, and that's why I was kind of saying that like me personally, I felt because, well, I guess if you, if we're going to really look at this, this really plays in the NBA's hands and maybe even to the NHL's hands. Cause I'm not sure how they were feeling, but remember there was already talks about the NBA wanting to start the season more towards December right. than, than in October, because when they start around Halloween, you're now still in the heart of the NFL season. Not really people care so much about the NBA unless you're a diehard NBA fan. Yeah. So we, if you start by the end of December, you know, by that time, the NFL season is starting to die and you would rather go head to head with the NFL for the last four weeks playoffs in the Super Bowl than trying to get them for at least uh, 12 or 16 weeks, we ate to the end of the season, mm -hmm. playoffs and Super Bowl. And then by the time it's over with, the NBA is trying to gain so much traction that, that it's almost borderline kind of lost. Yeah. So I guess I kind of get them to that extent of what they're trying to do. I still thought that the NFL, because there was so much time, because with baseball, with baseball, the problem was was that you had the owners versus the players in a sense where the players wanted to get paid and wanted to make sure that they were safe and wanted to make sure that they didn't lose anything and trying to make sure that, you know, 
if they did get sick, they had some insurances and stuff. And the owners were kind of like, well, you didn't play the full season, so we should have to pay you as such. Yeah. And we don't want to be the fault if you're doing this. And we don't want to be at fault if you get sick and all this other stuff. And they went back and forth, back and forth. And now all of a sudden, out of the Kier Club Blue, they decided they had a 60-game season. And a lot of teams have now started their spring training. I know the Yankees started there. Yeah, White Sox Gar- are yeah, already Gary starting Cole their sort of out camp. there yeah. still throwing gas left and right, <laughs> apparently. So so my thing is, I I. I still, in in a sense, think that the NBA and the NHL, I think, should have almost just stayed canceled. Yeah. And just be like, 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 well, everyone's like, well, Nick, what do they, what should they do about champion? Do you have to put an asterisk that says had to cancel season due to coronavirus? There's going to be an asterisk do? either way, right? right. Like what now, there's gonna, people are saying, well, okay, uh, it's not going to mean as much, you know, winning a, a championship. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I, I think a championship is a championship, right? But there's always going to be an asterisk, right? So you have to take that into consideration. Like even Giannis said, um, you know, people are saying that this is going to be, you know, sort of a, a tainted championship, and. I agree with what he said. He said, in a way, it's going to be harder to win this championship this year because everybody sort of had this reset. Everybody sort of left their flow. I'll be honest with you, Nick. The first two or three weeks of of the NBA is going to look ugly, no matter what anyone says, because people are saying they've been in the gym and they're working out and this and this. It's going to be ugly, dude. It's going to be it's going to look like preseason. And then, you know, thankfully, obviously, they have the bubble in in. Uh, Florida for the for the for the teams who are in contention, and now they want to open up a bubble in Chicago for those who aren't in contention. Um, which to me is like, why you want to have an NIT tournament just for the sake of? Because again, you hit it on the head. It's about profit at the end of the day. Yep. And the the owners only have one one worry. It's are we going to make money from this? And because they've been hemorrhaging money the last couple of months, that's really all that's been on the minds of owners and and the leagues. And the MLB has been a perfect example of that, of they've been shuffling their feet for three damn months. We could have been playing by now, but because they've been shuffling their feet about profits and because, you know, listen, everyone's losing money right now. The UFC, they estimated something like a couple hundred thousand for every single uh, 10 fans that isn't in a vi- that isn't in the stands that lose a couple hundred thousand dollars. I know you mentioned earlier that uh, that, you know, uh, baseball or I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, football was talking about how they're going to lose millions and millions of dollars if people aren't in the stands. So at the end of the day, us as sports fans, do we really care about how much money? Jerry Reinsdorf or, you know, the Glazers are making right. from, from these, from these games. Not really. Right. No, I want to see sports. And I think at the end of the day, you know, we, d- sports is a refuge, you know, sports is like something that you almost need in life to kind of distract you from some of the serious stuff. Right. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, we've had so much serious stuff for the last five or six months um, in different ways. Like, you know, the coronavirus, obviously everything happened socially. And I think what it will do now is show, and I think it's sort of unveiling for some of these casual fans that, bro, this, they don't care about you. Right. They don't care about the fans. They don't, they care about making that money that, that you real. give them yep. uh, when you go and attend these games. And also now, they're going to try and capitalize on these TV deals. We'll see. I can care less about how much money the NFL makes or the NBA makes or the MLB makes because they're making money hand over the fist last 20 years. So, you know, I'm happy that sports are back, but I agree with you. It's a little bit weird to see how desperate they were to get the seasons going. It's almost as if they're like, no, we can't afford to lose this much money. So they said, we'll, we'll even ruin the product. And, you know, uh, I, I know the NBA was talking about maybe doing rule changes during the uh, bubble just to say, you know what, we we can do something different. You know, I'm not sure about all that. I think I think they have an opportunity here to show that the 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 pace of play can be different, but we can still have an entertaining game. I'm hoping that's what it is, but who knows, dude? We could be watching some shit games uh, to start off. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, you know, especially what I'm baseball. or or somebody getting hurt or you know some you know whatever the case is, but. You know, I, 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 again, you know, because football is king in, in, in America, you know, no matter you how you were thinking you they were going to work around football, right? So you're, so it's like, okay, this is what the NFL did. This is what we can do. Yeah. We can kind of, they'll be like the model and then we can either do a little bit of this or not do a little bit of that. And yeah. we can do this and that and everything else and just get it. Cause think about it. Everybody's in, everyone's still in off season mode. Yeah. You know, and, and, and baseball is going to be 90%. ugly. I mean, baseball 
there's a reason why spring training is spring training. And there's a reason why March, April, and May baseball isn't that pretty those months. No. So when you have a 60 game season, half of that is going to be spent getting into the groove. And if you're a starting pitcher, you know, it takes sometimes 10 starts for you to get a groove and you're not going to have 10 starts in a 60 game season. And that's why I was thinking if you didn't have anything etched in stone by, well, I guess the all-star game would have been coming up here soon. Yeah. Then what's the point? Like if, and at this point it's like, if you didn't have anything by June to get these guys ready by July, and then you have July, August and whatever little bit of September, mm -hmm. you know, before we get to the play. Well, I guess majority of it's because October's playoff baseball. So now you have three months. So you use June as your spring training month. You got July, August and September as your playing months. OK, I would have been cool with that. But now you're using July by the and like you said, by the time you get traction and you're starting to get a feel what well, it's playoff baseball. We're like 41, 19 going to the to the playoffs. And you have like a three man rotation probably because I mean, let's be honest. Um, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be like the NBA was talking about how the, the games are going to basically start at 9 AM and they're going to happen all the way through until 10 PM, you know, um, from entertainment value, that's great. But is that going to work from a player's perspective? Right. That like now I'm going to get up at 9 AM and then tomorrow I have another game at 7 PM. And it's like, you know, I get that they were trying to force like, let's, let's use a premier league for an example. Um, the premier league, the so main soccer league in Europe that's located in the UK. Um, they originally said, we're going to cancel the season. And there was a lot of hoopla because it's like, they've only had like six teams win the premier league since two, uh, the 1992. Right. That's how much parody. There's not a lot of parody. It's basically Manchester United, Man City, uh, uh, I know Leicester City won it a couple of years ago. And then, and then like two other teams, that's basically it. Liverpool had, a, 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 a 93 Bulls type of season or 96 Bulls type of season this year. And people are saying it would be a shame if they didn't finish the season out. So next thing you know, they say, okay, we'll just finish the season out with no fans. They're losing money, but you don't hear one peep about them losing money because let's be honest, it's much more profitable for them, right? Right. Like, like the, the Liverpool, uh, LeBron James is part owner, the Fenway, uh, the people who own Fenway in Boston, they are part owners of the Liverpool group and Liverpool. Was that the Henry's? The Henry's. Yeah. And, and they're the same ones who own sort of the, the Fenway. And like I said, LeBron James is a, is a, is a minority owner and they are, I mean, they're, they're projected to be a billion dollar business by next year. So they're not struggling at all. Right. So they kind of saw it in a way of like, like we're not going to, I mean, most people were going to lose money, but the, 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 the need for soccer or football, as they call it in, in the UK is like a religion, right? For here, we, we have that sort of with football, maybe kind of, sometimes you get that with baseball, but soccer has been around since the 1800s yeah. for them yeah. and they've been doing it for so long. And there's, let's be honest, there's 700 professional teams in uh, the UK spread out through four tiers of of leagues. So you have the Premier League, you have the EFL Championship, uh, uh, the the League uh, Three, and the League. So you have four tiers with twenty teams each, and then there's literally hundreds of teams that are fighting every single year to jump into those spots. So the competitiveness is much more. So I understood when they opened the season up, but for us, we still haven't really established ourselves at that point. And um, because of how America was struggling in general, I was surprised to see it. But um, the, you know, they're they're playing right now, the Premier League, and uh, I know Liverpool already won, so they already clinched, um, which is kind of weird for them. Like, they were going to clinch anyways. I right. think they were like, I think there's six games left, but they've already won the championship. So why are they still playing? I, I don't understand it. Me either. But as you said, we're trying to get, trying to, we, life may not be what it used to be, but we're just trying to get the train back on the track just right chugging now. chugging along. That's the best we can do. All right, man, well, we are about, Almost to that hour and a half mark. Yes, sir. I mean, that's really all we really have, you know, until we, as the days go on, we'll start really learning of everything that's happening. Yeah. We'll start learning of, you know, if baseball, because I know Mike Trout came out and said he still doesn't feel comfortable about being out there. So we'll see. And every day more NBA players are coming out and saying they're not feeling comfortable. They're not feeling comfortable. So that's why I'm still thinking, you know, the, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, what's the Ranger superstar? Our Temi Panarin came out and said he he doesn't know if he's comfortable about coming in, and and you know 
these foreign players, man, it's got to be tough. I mean, like, you know, you're coming from Russia and then like, that's why Khabib didn't want to fight because it's like, dude, I may not be able to come back and to the country. Just, yeah. And his dad good. just passed yeah. away. So RIP to, uh, to his dad, who's a, who's a legend in the sport. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of awesome to see like Conor McGregor and Tony Ferguson come out and give their condolences. And right. like, it's a cool thing about sports, man. It's like at the end of the day, dude, like we're all sort of human yep. and we kind of are bonded together with this weird netting of sports. And, um, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, dude, like Conor McGregor, I'm not a huge fan of him. But when you see Conor McGregor go out and and basically, you know, put out a sincere message to uh, to Khabib, uh, that was great to see. And it's it's going to be tough, dude, like like even doing the show, Nick, you know, we wanted to do the show. We wanted we never wanted to stop. Let's be right. honest. The only reason why we stopped is because. A, we wanted to make sure that we were kind of practicing um, the same social distancing that everyone did. And we did that. Um, but then when everything looked a little bit better on the social distancing side and we thought it was going to be a little bit safer to come to the studio, there was nothing to talk about. Right. And even now it's like, we are, we are sort of talking about speculation. Like we don't know things can change next week. We could come in here and you could, you know, hear about how everything's canceled. So you just have to be ready for whatever at this point. Um, but we appreciate you guys sticking by with us and kind of, you know, hanging out and, and again, you know, Please feel free to uh, to you know voice your voice your um, you know your opinions in, in the comments and continue to share out the show. We really appreciate the support and uh, we are back. Um, and you know, like I said, hopefully sports follows suit. But there's only so much we can do in the studio, right? Like if Facts. sports aren't going on, we don't have shit to talk about, guys. But unless unless we hear some some else. NFL will still rank king, and I feel like they're not stopping that season no. whatsoever. And we'll have you don't have stuff the highest too. rated dr watch draft, and then be like, well, guys, I guess we just can't have a maybe season. we shouldn't have a season. Like, no, you're nah, gonna have. Like, you and by the season. way, NBC, um, CBS, Fox, they're gonna love them coming back because they're struggling the most right now. Yeah, like some of these networks, they're trying to put out these shows to get people's attention. Nobody's buying it right nah. now. Even sports fans, like you know, I see sports fans trying to like glom on to like uh, bags and like any sport they can just to, just to have something. ESPN eight. Ocho, Ocho, yeah, <laughs> Ocho, yeah. So um, we'll see. But at the end of the day, there is there is a thirst for sports and. They need to fill that up. And I'm hoping that we don't have any like weird, like, I don't want to say this. I don't want to put this energy out in the world, but something tells me this NBA thing is going to go a little bit wrong. I meaning, so meaning like everyone's going to expect it's going to go smoothly. And next thing you know, somebody gets sick and oh my God, by the way, and they're having them wear these tracking wristbands, by the way, it's almost, it's apparently you wear it no matter what at Disneyland, but I've never been there. Um, it's like a tracking wristband, which basically, you know, it tracks where you're going. So if somebody's infected, they can go back and see who they've interacted with, where they've gone. But let's just say, for example, I mean, LeBron James, I don't want to use that as bad, but LeBron James, um, he tests positive. Next thing you know, LeBron James is the most popular player in the whole damn bubble, and every single player is out dapping up with LeBron. We might have a problem there, man. Huge problem. Huge problem. So I'm we'll see. I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it, but at the same time, man, like I see some of the concerns that people are talking about. Most definitely. All right, guys. Well, it was fun. Yes, sir. Being back in the studio, and we will see you guys potentially next week, and we'll have more to talk about. And hopefully, we'll have schedules to talk about. We'll have too. schedules to talk about. Yeah. And. We'll be getting into training camp segments and Can't wait for that, man. the NFL be coming and no one announced who's the number one pick in the NHL, right? Not yet. No, no. And also the NHL, they, they were talking about going straight into the playoffs and a lot of people were saying, well, why go into straight into the playoffs? Remember, they were talking about maybe doing a tournament to figure out the last couple seeds. So the, N the NHL is or still a best of three best of or three. something yeah. like that. So the NHL is still sort of up in the air, too. So um, a lot of things are going to change here. So follow the Mac and Black page, guys. Uh, we will be updating things as they go along. And then obviously next week when we come in, we'll give you everything. And the only have. reason why I'm OK with that is because if the Rangers beat the way they had it. Uh, lined up that the Rangers would play the Hurricanes. Remember, the Rangers traded Brady Shea to Carolina for their first round draft pick. So, so if the Rangers were actually to beat Carolina, they get a better pick. Not <laughs> only would they have be going to the Stanley Cup, a one step closer Stanley Cup final, they would still be in a top five pick. Wow! How 
Thank God for JD and Scott Gordon. They have been doing nothing but paying dividends. The cup will be coming back home <laughs> to New York where it belongs. We're hyping it up already, baby. Hell got they right. Can't wait. Hell right. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you probably next week. For Mac, I'm Black. See you guys later. Peace. Peace.